Hello friends and neighbors. Thanks for coming back to my channel again. Do you like my hair? I'm experimenting with my hair color. I have this fantastic day job where I'm a party princess uh, for children's parties. So I dress up as different uh, princess characters and most of the princesses are blonde and I wear all the poofy dresses and everything and I play hot potato and uh, musical chairs and stuff with kids. So I have to keep my hair blonde. So this just washes out, but I think it suits me. I kind of like the strawberry blonde. I think it makes my eyes pop. I used to be a redhead and I love being a redhead, but it's also so fun being a blonde. Blondes have more fun. I don't know. I think redheads and blondes might have an equal amount of fun. I'm going to tell you the truth. <laughs> but yeah, it looks good and it looks better on camera than it does in the mirror, which is kind of an interesting phenomenon. Hmm, we'll see. We'll see. Anyway, I'm sure you're not here to hear all about my hair. You're probably here because today we are reviewing the last of the Holy Trinity, as I shall be referring it to it as. Uh, this was the first one with the front back. Ugh, I'll just, oh, I always do this. There we go, the front and the back on the cover. <laughs> And this one had a front and a back, super cool. And I found out there was a third. This one actually has the Playmate of the Month, which is uh, the front and the back, like her actual centerfold is front and back, but I'm not gonna show you that yet. We're gonna wait until we've gone through. This also happens to be uh, the 20th anniversary issue. And so, as you can see, it is a ponderous tome and there's no way we could read everything and review everything in it. So I just picked some of my favorite things. Let's dive right in. Oh, the first thing right off I think is so cute. This isn't exactly a two-sided, uh, oh wait, I didn't cover up uh, her melons. I also have to be more careful in saying uh, particular words because not that I'm trying to get monetized or anything on here, but I think it will actually kind of Walk me. Ah, this is a problem. Here we go. Okay, there we go. <laughs> okay, so the bunny, you see how a hand is reaching up and she stole his bow tie. How cute is she? I'm just loving this little interaction with the Playboy bunny there. Cute, cute, cute. Ah. Pull all the post-it notes off as soon as you're done. Ooh. I don't know why I'm obsessed with these ads, but whenever I see a Chanel number no. five, I always get excited. <laughs> I think it's because my grandmother had Chanel number no. five and she preached to me into my young ears the importance of having a lady's perfume. Speaking of my grandmother, I am totally loving this advertisement also. We were Mormon, so we did not drink alcohol, but it's the punch bowl back there with those crystal glasses around it. And then that old fashioned cabinet with all the dishes and stuff in there. My grandma had one of those, uh, a hutch, a china hutch. Is that what that's called? I'm not sure. I cannot recall. They're old fashioned and glorious and you see them in all kinds of old people's houses. Okay. So, uh, one of the best things about this particular magazine is it has a fabulous interview with none other than Hugh Hefner, the editor of the famous magazine. So, since this is in fact Playboy, and this is in fact a uh, interview by the man himself, if you know anything about Hugh Hefner, you know that he loves to hear himself talk. <laughs> there's a lot of things I admire about him and there's a lot of things that I can totally burn him about. I generally appreciate him as a cultural icon and what Playboy represents to me. But one thing that I also like about Hugh Hefner is how interesting he is. He definitely always keeps you on your toes. So, uh, but he also talks and talks and talks. Oh my God, if you ever, I tried to read I'm trying to read all of the Playboy philosophy. That's one reason I started getting all these uh, vintage Playboys. 
but oh my god talk about i call this a ponderous tome every time he sits down to write an issue of the playboy philosophy it is a ponderous tome and how did uh abraham lincoln think i think said um something about how he can put the fewest ideas into the most words out of every man i ever heard and i don't think hugh hefner quite takes it to that extreme but boy I think this was definitely during the period when he had the <laughs> those uh, pep pills. What they call them in the documentary? I forget. So, <clears throat> okay, here we go. I picked out the most important parts I felt from this interview that I thought were really interesting. It's a little bit long, so bear with me. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is Hef speaking here. It may not surprise you to learn that I also think Playboy is one of the most important and influential magazines in the world in terms of the impact it's had not only on sexual mores, but also as a champion of individual rights. Somewhere in between our covers, though you look like the type that never gets beyond the centerfold, half, what a burn, you may have noticed that we're devoted, that we've devoted a great deal of space in articles, in interviews, in the Playboy Forum to championing for others the same freedoms and opportunities we're lucky enough to have ourselves. Lucky enough to enjoy ourselves. Playboy, have you done anything to support these freedoms and opportunities apart from advocating for them in your magazine? Hefner, that's why I started the Playboy Foundation, which backs many of the same causes we espouse in the magazine especially the ones that are unpopular enough to have been left marginally unattended to by the government and other foundations. We've supported countless civil liberties cases, the anti-war movement, Jesse, Jackson, Jesse Jackson's push and other civil rights organizations, political reform, sex research and education, abortion reform, prison reform, and the continuing campaign to reform our repressive sex and drug laws as well as any number of charities and community fund efforts. For a long time, we were the chief sponsor of the Kinsey Institute and the research of Masters and Johnson, and right now we're the biggest financial supporter of the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws, because I think making criminals out of people who smoke marijuana is very damaging to the social fabric of this society. I've made the social commitment through this and similar foundation formed and a, and a similar foundation formed at the same time, they're the major beneficiaries of my stock in Playboy. I can't believe this is 1974. I cannot believe that I'm making this in 2022 and we are still fighting against the prohibition of marijuana laws. It's just astonishing to me. Uh, Playboy, the funds for your foundation come from profits on what life called the house that flesh built. I'm talking only, uh, by talking only of Playboy's editorial and financial commitment to social and political causes, aren't you downplaying the importance of nude pictures in the magazine's success? Hefner. I never want to be accused of that. I love those ladies. They are and always will be an integral part of Playboy's total editorial package just as sex should be an integral part of the total human experience. Playboy has tried to integrate the erotic and intellectual interests of its male readers, and that has proved to be far more controversial and misunderstood an editorial concept than I could have guessed when we began. Even as, even as relatively sophisticated a magazine as Newsweek has criticized Playboy for marring its otherwise excellent editorial content, with, it, with what it termed to be a peekaboo interest in sex. But as far as I'm concerned, incorporating the two is Playboy's greatest virtue. I agree. There's a decontaminating process that takes place as a result of the open publication of nude pictures of the human body. I'm convinced that because of Playboy, our society suffers from fewer sexual hangups than it did 20 years ago. I also agree with that. There are still people, of course, who insist that they, who insist that they don't think sex is dirty, but think that it ought to remain private, a concern of the individual. 
they fail to understand the nature of human sexuality. If you don't encourage healthy sexual expression in public, you get unhealthy sexual expression in private. If you attempt to suppress sex in books, magazines, movies, and even everyday conversation, you aren't helping to make sex more private, just more hidden. You're keeping sex in the dark. What we've tried to do is turn on the lights. I love that. I love every sentence of that. Playboy. But the magazine's nude photography has been criticized for encouraging not open, healthy sexuality, but a voyeuristic look-but-don't-touch attitude. Hefner. There's a lovely line in our new film, The Naked Ape. You must have had the Playboy movies going on at the time. I know they used to have all that. <clears throat> the Naked Ape. Voyeurism is a healthy, non-participatory sexual activity. The world should look at the world. We are sexual beings, whether we try to deny it or not, and open, healthy sexuality requires that we not be ashamed of our own bodies. When Playboy started, most men probably would have been uneasy in the presence of a wife or girlfriend about opening up a magazine with nude pictures in it. What Playboy has been saying is that a person shouldn't feel guilty about an open interest in sex. We've taken some of the shame and mystery out of human sexuality, and it's this kind of repression of our sensual interests that has led to the kind of voyeurism that makes looking into a substitute for, rather than a preamble to, touching. I really like everything he says there. Uh, I pretty much agree with it. I think it's right on, and it touches on a lot of the sentiments that have made uh, Playboy such a meaningful uh, entity to me personally. Playboy. It's been said that Playboy is hung up on youth as well as pulchritude. I had to look that word up. It's a fancy word for beauty. <laughs> and that is doing a disservice to older women by fostering an adolescent taste in men for pretty young girls. Oh, I think they're right. Does that mean that Playboy would, oh, this is Hefner. Hefner replies. <clears throat> Does that mean Playboy would be more mature if it ran photos of 40 year old playmates? Why, yes. Yes, Hef. It would mean that. Nice dodge, by the way. If I prefer to publish pictures of pretty young women, and I do, it seems to me that says less about Playboy's maturity or mine than it does about our society's emphasis on youth and beauty. Yet another dodge. My taste in women isn't exactly a personal aberration. It happens to be shared with some 26 million Playboy readers. Playboy readers are no different in this regard from the overwhelming majority of the male population in the world. Since time immemorial, youth has set the universal standard of physical beauty, and the reason is simply that shapely, firm, young face and body are more attractive sexually and aesthetically than bulges, sags, and wrinkles. Okay. First of all, there's no such thing as a standard from time immemorial. If we look at the figurines from um, the prehistoric days, like the Venus of Willendorf, Willendorf, I'm not sure how you say that, um, but a lot of them are obese women with saggy boobs and big butts and everything. And I guess I can't really tell age off of those uh, little, those little figurines. But there's no such thing as a universal beauty standard. And so just saying, oh, well, this is just the society's emphasis on youth and beauty. Yeah, there is something to that. But also remember how earlier we were talking about how it's important that people don't be ashamed of their bodies and we should have open sexuality. It seems like there's a bit of a disconnect there between only displaying the most young and traditionally beautiful bodies and not displaying any of the others, which are legitimately beautiful also because beauty is in the eye of the beholder and that's one thing I love about modern Playboy is they really have kind of taken care of that um, singular beauty standard and allowed of lots diff lots of <laughs> allowed lots of different types of beauty uh, to be displayed so I think that's something that um, Hef did not do so great out but Playboy's doing a great job at today <sighs> um, hmm, okay Playboy, according to some members of the women's liberation movement, the girls featured in Playboy, particularly the Playmates, are treated as sex objects. Hefner, 
Playboy treats women, and men too for that matter, as sexual beings, not as sexual objects. Not as things, but as people. I think in this sense, Playboy has been an effective force in the cause of female emancipation. Gloria Steinem once called me the father of women's liberation, and I rather liked that. She didn't mean it in the complimentary sense, of course, but there's more truth to that interpretation than Gloria would care to admit. In his opinion, of course. <laughs> Although I do kind of agree, but I just think the way he talks is kind of funny. <clears throat> as far back as the Playboy philosophy, I wrote that the major beneficiaries of sexual emancipation would be women because they've been the major victims of our repressive sexual heritage, which relegated women to the level of chattel. First, the possession of their fathers and then of their husbands. Female virginity has been prized in our society simply because an unused position is valued more highly than a used one. It's part of our Judeo-Christian heritage that women are either good girls or bad girls on the basis of their sexual behavior. Women have traditionally been either put on pedestals or damned as a source of all sexual temptation and sin. These are two sides of the same coin since both place women in a non-human role. Playboy has opposed these warped sexual values and in doing so, helped women step down from their pedestals and enjoy the nature of sexuality as much as men. I really agree with a lot of that. They're either being, you know, chattel, which is dehumanizing, or placed up on pedestals as like goddesses, which is also dehumanizing. Um, so I really do agree that women have been the major victims of sexual repression and therefore should have the most to gain. But I also think there's some cognitive dissonance going on here with him that he's really only uh, treating as human the women who he is personally attracted to and only respecting women who you want to bang is not really respecting women so I think this is a big step forward but I also see some uh, kind of hang-ups here in his mentality in my personal opinion <laughs> Uh, Playboy. The trouble is that many women find the image of a pinup nude dehumanizing. Ugh, I personally hear this one all the time. It makes me crazy. Hefner. The innovation of our Playmate pictorials was an attempt to humanize the pinup concept. There's a rich tradition of pinup art in America that goes back to September Morn, the Gibson girl at the turn of the century, John Held, the John Held girl in the 20s, and the Petty and Varga girls of the 30s and 40s. They were all unreal, highly stylized projections of erotic male fantasies. Pinup photography followed in the same tradition, using movie stars and glamour girls of the period, sexual images unattainable to us mere mortals, in unnatural poses and artificial studio sets. Playboy changed all that. For our Playmate features, we chose girls from everyday life. Secretaries, college students, airline stewardesses, airline stewardesses but notably, not strippers, huh, half. Double standard, I don't approve. Uh. Instead of aloof movie queens or professional models, we pose them naturally in real life settings. Accompanying the pictures is a story about the girl that adds her reality as a person. The entire girl next door concept that we created for our centerfold was intended to make the playmates more a part of real life for our readers. If some people still consider it dehumanizing for women to appear naked in the pages of a men's magazine, they're really objecting to the sexual connotations in the pictures, and that's just the same old repressive puritanism under a different label. Totally agree. Totally agree with that. Playboy, part of the public's curiosity about you has to do with the nature of your personal relationships with the women you pick as playmates. Tell us about that. Hefner, there isn't any casting couch involved, if that's what you mean. I've been personally involved with a number of our playmates over the years, but I've never let my personal life interfere with the editing of the magazine or vice versa. Okay, I'm really glad that you think that and that you recognize that you shouldn't be casting couch these girls, casting couching these girls, whatever the right term would be. But uh, it's highly inappropriate that he was ever involved with women in his employ. Uh, in the military, they have a rule about not being able to date people 
uh, who are in a rank above you because you can't properly give consent to someone who has authority over you. And I think in an employee employer situation, it's exactly the same thing. So yeah, I recognize, I'm glad that you recognize that a casting couch is a bad thing and an inappropriate thing, but to a degree that is what he was doing and it's problematic and he's definitely paying the price for it now <laughs> with all of the the uh, angry girls coming out of the woodwork uh, in the Secrets of Playboy documentary and other things like that. Well, you shouldn't have crossed those lines, Hef. You shouldn't have. Uh, Playboy. Most of the women we've seen you around are at least 20 years younger than you. Why? Hefner, for one thing, I simply find them more attractive physically than women my own age. There's also something nice about an affair that's the first serious relationship in a girl's life. It permits you to recapture your own early romantic responses. It's a way of holding on to your youth and the enthusiasm you first felt about life and love. I think that's very romantic and I bet there's a lot of truth behind that. But that also reminds me of a very, a very recent quote that we were reading in here about society's emphasis on virginity and belongings which are used versus unused. I think that he was a lot more affected by that than he likes to let on and I think it's highly problematic. <laughs> Playboy. It's been argued by a number of female writers who've written articles about you that what you're really doing is avoiding more mature women who might challenge you and demand more equality in a relationship. Hefner. I don't think an older woman is necessarily any more of a challenge than a young one. I think we all know that's a lie. <laughs> young people today have really got it together in a way that we never did when we were their age. I think that's probably some truth to that. You know, the 50s versus the 70s were very different times, but that's also something that groomers say. So careful there, Hef. I think it's a mistake to prejudge any relationship on the basis of the ages of the two people involved. True. Our society's condemnation of relationships between older women and young men is particularly strong, and it doesn't make any sense to me at all. I have a secretary who happens to be into younger guys right now, and I think it's groovy. Each individual has the right to decide for himself or herself, and no one else is really in a position to make that decision for them. Very true. Different strokes for different folks. But let me also add that I don't go for looking looking for any sort of challenge in romance. I want a woman who compliments the person I happen to be and not one who wants to make me over or demands the kind of relationship I'm not comfortable with. Well, sure, I think anyone, that, that's fine for anyone. I'm not looking for a female Hugh Hefner. A romantic relationship for me is an escape from the challenges and problems I face in my work. Sounds very 1950s, as emancipated as, and, and uh, forward-thinking as he claims to be. I hear a lot of uh, very 1950s ideas about uh, romance and, frankly, the role of women that he desires, which he's not saying that that's where they should be. He's just saying that's what works for him. So that's a very important difference there, I think. But interesting, interesting, interesting. Um... It's a psychological and emotional island I slip away to, away from the trials and tribulations of the rest of my life. I pity the man who goes home from the hassles of his workday to a wife or girlfriend who also gives him a hassle. I'm not going to pattern my life after some fashionable notion of an emancipated relationship in which both partners are equal. Ooh, careful, Hef. If that works for others, that's okay, but it wouldn't work for me. I admit to being rather strong-willed, a rather strong-willed individual, and I make most of the decisions in my life, and I like it that way. I think he has a weird definition of challenge, like not challenging to you, stupid, like challenging you to become a better version of yourself, not someone who's trying to like one up you, someone who's pushing you to be a better version of yourself. I think he has a weird perception of what challenge in a relationship can and should be. Playboy, do your girlfriends like it too? Hefner, if they didn't, they wouldn't stick around but I tend to be attracted to the sort of woman who isn't competitive and doesn't feel frustrated or resentful when she isn't in charge. There is still a great many women around who want a man to call the shots, establish the nature of the relationship and so forth. So forth. If that's male chauvinism, so be it. Male chauvinism, huh? That's an interesting word. If that's the way I am, uh, that's the way I am and I don't apologize for it. 
but that doesn't mean I exploit a woman with whom I'm involved or that I'm insensitive to all of her interests or desires. Quite the contrary. All I'm saying is that each individual ought to seek the kind of relationship that most satisfies his or her needs, a partner who compliments him rather than competes with him emotionally. Okay, yeah, definitely. Uh, nobody wants that kind of challenge in a relationship where you're competing with each other emotionally. Ew, no, thank you. You definitely want someone who compliments you and your lifestyle. But I also think that he speaks a lot of truth there when he says, I'm not looking for someone to challenge me. I think he wanted something easy and happy and it's interesting that he says the first serious relationship in a girl's life. Hef, you were the opposite of serious. You were advocating for fun, temporary, light-hearted relationships. There's nothing serious about any of the relationships that women had with Hugh Hefner, except for maybe his first two wives. <laughs> in my opinion, in my opinion. I think he was a great sugar daddy but he was no boyfriend and he was no husband. Not one that I would ever have accepted anyway, but oh, he sounds like he would have been the most wonderful sugar daddy. I would have loved to be his sugar baby. Uh, Playboy, isn't any involvement with more than one girl at a time bound to cause complications? Hefner, it depends on the relationships, I think, and what sort of understanding you have with the girls involved. There's always the chance of someone's being hurt in any romantic situation, and if you care about the feelings of others, that can produce conflicts and tensions, some of them self-imposed, some imposed by circumstances. I'm aware that any woman with, I'm, with whom I'm involved may have needs or desires that are different from my own, and when that happens, you have to adjust the relationship accordingly. Oh, sure, absolutely. Oh, that also kind of reminds me of I feel so bad for the girls who are talking about the bad experiences they had with Hugh Hefner and Playboy when they were there, but it's also very frustrating to me because all of these women were of legal age at the time and all of these girls were, in fact, were using that word as like a complimentary word, girls. They were women. These were grown ass women and a lot of them allowed themselves to be abused and put into situations that they should have womaned up and walked themselves out of. We're not victim blaming at all. But I do think that, you know, so many times people allow themselves to get into situations where you're hurt and you could stay there and continue being hurt or you can stand up for yourself and leave. And so many times, like so many girlfriends I hear about, you know, their boyfriend did something mean and then they kiss and they make up and they go back again and again. It's that abusive cycle that I'm certainly not condemning the abused person for, but I... Ugh. I was abused as a child and that was because when I ran away, the police brought me back. I had no choice. I don't understand people who stay there and choose to be abused. It's astonishing to me that that happens so often in the world. I, I, I can't quite wrap my head around it, but maybe someday I will. <laughs> um. Uh, oh, this is Hefner still. There are legitimate reasons for getting married, but there are also legitimate reasons for not getting married. And in my case, those are rather dominant. I have this keenly developed sense of personal freedom, a portion of which you inevitably give up when you accept the responsibilities that go with marriage. It would mean that I'd be living much of my life according to a preconceived set of expectations that, at this time at least, I'm not willing to accept. I think most people wind up living their lives according to other people's expectations and forgetting about what they really want for themselves. And that would drive me up a tree. I love that one. One of my favorite quotes out of Hugh Hefner's mouth of all time, of favorite quotes of all time in general is, life is too short to be living anybody else's dream. Amen. Playboy, in other words, you're selfish. Hefner, everyone is and should be. It's just that we all have different ways of expressing our self-concern, some of it enlightened and some of it hurtful, to ourselves and to others, as well as to society at large. This above all, to thine own self be true, and it must follow as the night the day thou canst not then be false to any man. I think there's considerable merit in that, and it was a favorite quote of mine when I was growing up. Me too. <laughs> I expressed some of my views on enlightened self-interest in the Playboy philosophy and some of the critics claimed that I was advocating a form of selfish hedonism, which isn't the case at all. What I'm saying is that every one of us needs a personal sense of identity and self-worth in order to function satisfactorily in society. 
If you haven't worked out your own needs, how can you successfully deal with anyone else's? If you don't like yourself, you're not going to be able to like those around you. As one who has learned to like himself just fine, I think I've taken an important step in getting myself together as a person. It's amazing how, once you take that step, a lot of the need to throw your weight around disappears. Because if you're content with who you are, you don't need to prove anything. I like that. Yeah, like I said, this is the longest article of all time, so we're not reading it all. <gasps> look, let's take an intermission really quick and look at this cigarette advertisement. <laughs> Cowboys smoke the cool cigarettes. What is it, Marlboro? Of course it is. <laughs> okay, we're almost done. This is the last, the last one. Okay, and we're done with this, with this article. I promise. <gasps> Pardon me. Playboy. As a guy who earned rather than inherited his money, who started out as a middle class working stiff, don't you ever take a look around at all of this incredible luxury and wonder if it's too good to be true? Feel that it's all a dream and maybe you'll wake up and it'll be all gone. Hefner, I still have a certain sense of wonder at all that's happened, but it adds to my enjoyment of it. I don't think I'll ever become jaded by the success of the life I'm leading. It's simply not in my nature. As a matter of fact, I feel like a kid in the world's biggest candy store. Playboy, must you be so blasé? Hefner, I could pretend to be blasé, but I'm having too good a time. Playing it cool, affecting that hip sense of weariness with it all that's so fashionable these days would be foreign to me. If my enthusiasm strikes some people as unsophisticated, that's their problem, not mine. Amen. So that was a very interesting article. Some of it I completely loved and agreed with. Some of it I thought was kind of a cop out and crap and I didn't like it all, but a very, very interesting stuff. It's one thing I absolutely love about, dis about Playboy, it never disappoints. So moving on, we have a short uh, fiction story by Vladimir Novikov. We shan't read it today, but I wanted to show you ah, this illustration that goes along with it. Looks very 70s to me. Very cool. Oh my gosh. Okay, so... Here is a naughty cartoon for your enjoyment. It reminds me of uh, many years ago, I don't know, five years ago, uh, I was down in Las Vegas and I fell on hard times and well, this would have been like actually 10 years ago. Um, and I ended up uh, becoming a stripper and I worked on a uh, Fremont Street, which is kind of like old school Las Vegas. And uh, I worked at this fabulous place called Glitter Gulch. And it has a rhinestone uh, neon cowgirl above it with a leg that kicks up like this. I don't know if I can show you. She has a leg that kicks like this. Woo -woo. And her name is Vegas Vicky. And she was the most fabulous thing in the entire world. And I always like to tell everyone that Glitter Gulch is my alma mater. I am very sad to say that this club no longer exists. It got kicked off probably because everyone loves to be so scandalous about strip clubs. Uh, but when I saw this cartoon, it reminds me of Vegas Vicky who was above the Glitter Gulch and what a glorious time I had at Glitter Gulch. It was so much fun. I was so blessed to get to dance there. I feel like it's this great little hidden piece of Americana that I got to be part of and oh, Oh, it was just fantastic. Very scary experience for me because I had just come out of the Mormon church and uh, was desperate for a job. I had tried to get so many jobs, but this was the height of the recession and there were no jobs to be had. So um, I realized that I didn't think there was anything immoral about stripping and I'd better give it a try because I could, I mean, every waitress job had 50 people lined up for it, but anyway. This is not, I'm doing a bad job reviewing the Playboy. <laughs> it's gonna be such a long video, you guys. Oh, here is a very cool one. This is an issue, or this is a little feature on some of the painted ladies. I had to block out some of the boobies, of course, but I thought this was so interesting. And you know how they have the painted girls who walk around the mansion all the time for I know they have them at Midsummer's Night Party. I would assume they have them at the other parties too. But I wondered if this is perhaps when they got that idea or they started getting the ideas to have body paint models. 
Uh, it's so much fun being a body paint model. I've done it myself a couple of times. Uh, at first you feel very naked, but after a while you get quite used to it and you forget that you're really not wearing any clothes, you're just wearing paint. It's very, very fun. Ah, oh, they've got an article on gangsters. How many of them can you name? When I went through, I knew uh, uh, Bugsy Siegel and I knew uh, Joe Adonis. Let's see. Who I recognize here? Oh, Lucky Luciano. I, yeah, some of these I don't actually fully know who they are, but I'm glad they have them on here because I'll be able to look them up for some of my fascination with the mafia. Oh, okay, here we are. Um, this is the Playmate of the Month. <clears throat> Miss Nancy Cameron. In spite of the fact that I've moved away from my hometown, says Nancy, I still don't consider myself a big city person. I like the restaurants, concert, and people of the city, but I've found that I'm happiest when walking through the woods or driving through the countryside. I guess my ideal in life is to combine the two worlds, but I've got lots of time to work that out, she says. So remember, this time, this is the very awesome one that has the double-sided centerfold. So of course I had to cover some of it up. Ugh, can you see? There you go. Isn't that cool? Sorry, I had to cover some of it up. You know the rules, it's not my rules, it's just those rules. I'll put it in here. Marvelous. So there we go, now we have completed the holy trinity of the double-sided uh, center folds. So now I think I have just a few more oh, hysterical uh, retro fashion pieces to show you that are amazing. Look at this guy's uh, cravat going on here. He's out of the 1600s. Ah, we got some cool stuff going on here, but I forgot to cover up their boobs. Let's cover them up real quick. Here we go. Okay. Isn't that so 1970s? That absolutely cracks me up. It has such Galaxina vibes to me too. Of course, I'm obsessed with Dorothy Stratton, but total Galaxina vibes. If you don't know who Dorothy Stratton is, you must go immediately and look her up. It is vital, vitally important that you know all about Dorothy Stratton. I am obsessed with her. So now we just have a quick little, uh, like, what do they call it? Album of memorabilia for their first 20 years. And there are some like uh, uh, boobies in here that I had to cover up, but I'm just gonna give you a quick run through of it. So you get a preview of all the cool stuff. There's far too much to really stop and read it. And also this video is super long anyway. <laughs> In the last video, I had this girl with the booty dress that you couldn't see very good. Look, here's the booty dress girl again. Except last time it was in color. The dress is pink. You can't really see it's pink there, but see the booty dress? It is a phenomenon. <laughs> yes! <laughs> Bloopers, outtakes. Let's see. Oh, I love this. The girl who does the Playboy bunny head. I'm gonna have to get a picture of me doing that one of these days. Oh, I was also reading on here. She is Ursula Andress, a 12 page photo feature by her then husband, John Derrick set the record as the longest Playboy pictorial ever devoted to one female star. So 
John Derrick, Ursula Andress. Is Ursula Andress the mother of Bo Derrick? I think this might be true. I will have to look this up. But when I saw that last name, it kind of went ding in my head. And I think this is the case. Oh my gosh, these bunnies in the corner. It totally reminds me of the Girls Next Door episode where I think it's Holly. She dresses up like a, a 4th of July bunny. It might have been Bridget. This sounds like something Bridget would do. She had a 4th of July uh, bunny outfit on and she was running all around and going down the, um, the slip and slide and her bunny tail was sagging down and it was drooping her drawers and you could see her little bunzolas hanging out the whole time. It's just like that. <laughs> Check that off. All right. Oh, this is a good one. This cracks me up. I always love their illustrations and cartoons. The magic has gone out of his carpet too. Tearing things apart. Be careful. Okay. Now this, this is a scandal and an intrigue. Okay. The movie is called Take Off and it shows a San Francisco stripper doing her thing, except that she's peeled off her clothes and then proceeds to remove her head, her legs, etc., until she's just a torso floating in space. The idea of the film is to show how dehumanizing a striptease can be. It's one of three flicks available on a rental basis. According to Alvin Firing at Polymorph Films, About Women is a feminist consciousness raising package, ideal for meetings of your friendly neighborhood women livers and not for chauvinist pig parties. Oink, what did they just say? Chauvinist pig parties. Didn't they have parties up at the mansion that they called the pig parties? Is that why they named them that? Don't get me wrong, I'm not too scandalized by men having hookers up to the mansion and having sex with them. I have nothing against sex work whatsoever. I'm not scandalized by that at all. But I wondered why they were called pig parties and that's not a very complimentary name. And now I'm wondering, was it a chauvinist pig party? That's charming. Interesting. I can't show you because there's boobs. I forgot to cover them up, whoops. But it's on page 238 of this uh, magazine if you wanna buy it and look it up. I just love all these advertisements for the Playboy clubs and resorts. I'm obsessed with them. I wish I could have gone back in the day. That would have been so awesome. Also, okay, so they have this magazine that apparently they're like co-publishing or something called We. I have never heard of it before. I have never seen one before, but I am quite intrigued now that I've found out about them. And I am gonna have to get one to see if it's as fun as Playboy. This one cracks me up. <laughs> Women take advantage of your natural assets. That's all I have to say. And this one, considering the theme of the Hugh Hefner interview that we read, which I feel is mostly Hugh Hefner has great ideas, but needs to grow up a little bit. Yay! That's fantastic. <laughs> yes, exactly what he needs. Just a little bit of maturity in his life. Well, thank you so much, you guys, for checking out this very cool 20th anniversary issue with the two-sided, ah, the two-sided playmate. And that completes our holy trinity. Thank you so much for coming to visit with me. I'm not sure which Playboy we'll be interviewing or interviewing, reviewing next time. Dang thing. But I hope it's as fun as these ones have been because uh, that has, was a ton of fun and I learned a lot. And I can't wait to see you guys next time. So take care until then. Don't do nothing I wouldn't do. <laughs>